let's talk a little NBA, talk a little baseball, a guy that knows everything. Everything, even the NFL. Our good friend Billy Osborne joins us. Ozzy joins us uh, for a couple minutes on the board while kind of hotline. What's going on, Ozzy? What's up, Rich? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, I thought you had somebody else going whole line when you said knows everything. Uh, <laughs> How's your summer been going, pal? How's your summer it's been? It's been going really well, thank you. It's been going really well, thank you. How about yours? Uh, going well, going well. We're uh, hanging tight in here. A lot of uh, NBA stuff. Uh, Phillies, yeah. uh, I think, playing some pretty good baseball. Let me. Uh, did you think going into the season, the expectations for the Phillies, were they were going to be as good as we've seen this year, especially with uh, Gabe Kapler? No, I mean, everybody thought, you know, this is a, at the best, you know, Middle of the you know of the division pot no nobody I don't think anybody thought they'd be you know where they're at now that many games above 500 especially with a, a new lineup kind of a suspect you know they had a couple starting pitching but you know the back half of their uh, the, the of their starting lineup or the starting pitching wasn't good their bullpen was suspect we saw it last year um, you know it just seemed like they had so many holes that there was no way that they were going to be able to do that and lo and behold and then with a new manager on top of that. And then, uh, and then, of course, they started the way they started. So it, it, I think they've done a tremendous job considering everything. It's amazing, too, when you consider that a lot of people wanted the uh, uh, the manager fired after two, three games into the season. Right, right. And, and, and how about, you know, you go out, and I was extremely vocal. I thought they should have went out and got Jake Arrieta, and he's been a disappointment. But you know this, if he picks it up in the second half of the season, it's almost like a midseason acquisition. I mean, now you add him. You're right, that 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 uh, former Cy Young Award uh, uh, form with uh, Eflin and Nola, and now you've got a nice one-two-three punch. Well, I think in getting him, they showed that they were, you know, they're they're they're, they're players. They weren't sitting back, and you know, there's always there's a lot of different reasons why somebody has success when they go to a new ball club. But I think that his body of work shows that a, it was a good move. B, it should have helped the Phillies, and C, it still can. not And I think that that's, that's what the Phillies really have to say. They're playing this well, and they're not getting a lot of contribution for him. When he starts picking it up, and again, there's so many reasons why, you know, a new acquisition, especially a new pitcher, is not successful on a new ball club. But, um, he, he, you know, if he just eats some innings for them and gets them into the fifth or sixth or seventh inning, that's a win, that's a win in itself, especially as you go down the stretch. You're going to need guys that can eat up innings. And uh, we've seen what can happen when you don't. You know, you can get a great starting pitcher, and next you know you hand over the bullpen, and you're like, what the heck just happened in right. the last three or four, you know, outs? Yeah. So uh, I'm with you. Uh, I guess I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I, I think they have some sustainability, but the Nationals, I think, eventually will come around. Atlanta's such a young team, and they've got uh, two or three of the best young prospects in the game. They're a great story as well. But listen, at 49 and 38, the Phillies have won eight out of their last 10. You just got to go series by series by series. And to me, that's been the most impressive uh, impressive point. Listen, I don't know what your thoughts on of them potentially making a move for Machado. I'm still not ready to trade guys like Herrera and Franco. Well, they definitely need, to, they definitely need an upgrade. And, you know, and let's face it, you know, you and I, maybe because we look a little bit different, but I think if you grab somebody off the street and say, like, who are their starting lineup? They probably had a better chance of telling you who the 1980 starting lineup was for the Phillies than they do in today's present team. I don't even know if I could give you their starting everyday lineup, you know, uh, from position players. It's, it, you know, when I saw it, I think that there's part of that out there where you need a draw, like you need a name. Remember, like, when Jim Tomey came, like, everybody yep. was thinking to himself, we didn't, we, you know, they finally got into the free agent. I guess you could say, uh, Frey, when they got a Jim Tomey, because now other free agents are like, whoa, the Phillies are paying that much money and they're going to still go after and try and be a contender. So I agree with you. you got to be really careful what you give up because they do have some success right now and you don't want to really mess with that chemistry, but they need another bat. Machado is still young. He's still got many, many productive years in front of him. So um, it'll be interesting to see what they do. But I'm telling you right now, the fact that the Phillies, are not talking about, and we're not talking about, you know, our golf game, and there is, they're still in the hunt for the playoffs, right. spot, you know, maybe as a wild card. Right. And we're in, we're in, the, you know, almost to the middle of July. Yep. You know, that's, that's a big difference in the last couple of seasons. Yep. Nope. I agree 100%. And the way the Mets are playing, lousy baseball and the Marlins, you discount them. It's really a three team race uh, in the NL. Let's switch gears for a couple of moments. Uh, well, hey, let me ask you a question. Yeah, go what ahead. Do you think, what do you think? What do you think? Machado's worth because I've been kind of going back and forth with this thing too. He's going to have a ridiculous you know, contract. It's going to be one of the richest contracts in baseball history. I know. 
that's that's the killer. And what does that do? What does that do to the Phillies, you know, market, you know, as far as you should say their payroll, as far as you know, because just by getting him, that, they, they still got other holes to fill. So you got to be really careful in how many years you lock them up. But you also don't want to give them a lot of money and give prospects away, and then you don't get to lock them up for the long term, you know, or at least get a couple years out of them. Yeah, so but I'm curious about what your what what his what his value is going to bring from a prospect standpoint. Remember, if you look at some of the base salaries right now, beside Arietta, Santana's making uh, fifteen something odd million. The rest of it is pretty yeah. manageable with Herrera right around three, Hernandez five, Nishak five, Franco just yeah. under three. But it's be, because people still look at them as a small market team, right? But they're really not because they play in a large market. But again, it always goes back. You know, I think their active payroll is right around eighty-five million. Okay, well that's a that's a that's a, uh, substantially less than they did when they were making their runs for when they were up you know up by the Yankees and the and the, and the Red Sox and some of those other teams. So there's definitely some room, but they just got to be really careful. But I'm like you, I'm more concerned about the prospects they give up. That's that's because exactly as we can see out there, you know, you can see some of these other teams that have made some runs. They haven't made runs because of acquisitions. They made runs because they had some homegrown talent. Come like the, up through like the, the Astros. Like, you know, yeah, like, like the, the Astros. Astros. And yeah. look what the Yankees yeah, are doing right now. Yeah. And the Yankees. Yep. Everybody thinks of the Yankees. I mean, yeah, they got Stanton, who was the biggest free agent out there at the time, but the, the majority of their lineup is grown from the bullpen. Yep. Yep. So that's a good, that's a really, nobody would ever think of that when they think of the Yankees. No, nobody. because pe- pe- people, they, they think they buy. All the stars, right? I mean, at the end of the day, but again, you look at guys like Hicks, you look at guys like Torres and uh, the Severinos and some of the guys on their staff, and you're getting some great production from uh, younger guys, and I already mentioned judges, we already know. Um, I'm curious, um, we've been talking a lot with the NBA, and now that we're into the offseason, and you hear some of the comments from the Sixers brass, still really without a legit GM in place, but I'll give Brett Brown some credit for being the interim GM, and you know, a lot of people want to slice apart the comments, right? Star hunting, star developing. To me, it's all sub, uh, subjective. It's all semantics at the end of the day because you were never getting LeBron. Uh, George, I don't really know. Leonard's that last bullet in the chamber. Now there's a potential report that they have some interest among other teams in Carmelo Anthony. Um, you know, listen, w- when you look back and you look at this team, successful season, no doubt. But I was making the point where they are in somewhat of a precarious position because LeBron bolts now the Eastern Conference to the Western Conference, so it's open. But yet, a team like the Raptors wins 59 games, but people think they've peaked because they haven't made a ton of moves. And then you look at the Sixers, they win 53 games, they win a first-round playoff series, and yet they really haven't made significant upgrades. They haven't because they also lost some of their shooters. So to me, maybe it's a minor upgrade, but if people look at it as a wash then who's to think they're not going to be right back in this situation next year and we're talking about them winning just a playoff series and maybe getting no further? Well, I think I, I think you make some really good points. And I think what's crazy, Richard, you would probably, you know, being in what you're doing, understand this too. I can't believe how much people are talking about the NBA still. What they've done in the last five years with that league – I mean, I can't remember ever talking about the NBA in summertime. I mean, it was almost like we couldn't wait until the NBA season got over. It was a deterrent for TV. Nobody even wanted to watch it. Maybe that was because the Sixers weren't really competitive. But I just think the league itself has done a really good job of marketing and and whatever, along with all the cable and everything else that's following it. But the interest in the NBA level is at an all-time high, which is great because, let's face it, Philadelphia, South Jersey, it's a great basketball area with a ton of tradition. So this is this is kind of fun when you can actually talk about it. And actually talk about it potentially with a team that has a shot to at least be competitive and not a team that's going to be a bottom dweller and make it fun to go watch the Sixers play. That being said, with LeBron leaving, it definitely leaves the whole East, you know, wide open. And it really does say yourself, you know, okay, you still got to win the NBA championship. So I heard you before I came on talking about you just don't want to be satisfied with just having a competitive team. You want to win the championship. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, on this standpoint here with the Sixers, they definitely need to add some pieces. And I think it shows you where they're at because they had to go sign, uh, they had to re-sign, you know, J.J. Redick. And I don't even think they wanted to re-sign him. And look at the offer they gave him. They got him for half the money. So they couldn't really part with them because they lost, as you said, they lost some really good shooters. And I think that's why Joel had such a really good season because 
it wasn't just pounded into him. If they doubled him or tripled him or tried to get him off the block, he could kick it. Mm -hmm. And the Sixers had some people that could knock down outside jump shots, which they haven't had in a long time. So that's good. And Ben Simmons is not that guy yet. And who knows what our number – I think the key to this – I've been thinking about this a lot. I think one of the keys to this is what our number one draft pick from last year. Markel Fultz. What happened to him? Yep, yep I agree what 100%. Yep. Right? Well, what, what do you do in that situation, though, Ozzy? What do you do, right? I mean, you, 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 listen, you played the games at the highest level. Like, you've got a kid now that was a high draft pick. Everyone's looking at them not getting Tatum, making a trade for Fultz, Tatum turning into a budding superstar in Boston. you got a 19-year-old that – psychologically or mental or the yips or was hurt all of a sudden has to correct his shot and now he's not going to play in the summer league you know again you talk about precarious positions you got a lot of stock a lot of stock in your future with this kid and you don't still know what he's capable of or not doing because he only played a handful of games agreed and i think what i here's what personally from what i saw i like and what i mean by that is He's a guy that can take you off the dribble, anybody off the dribble at any time. And I like the way he kind of works with the Sixers because the Sixers are exciting because they're not a they're not a they're not a pounded into uh, you know like when when you and, and listen he was a great player Melo is a great player but let's face it he just gobbles up the ball when it comes <laughs> into him everything stops exactly it just goes yeah well, Marshall and the Sixers aren't like that. They got a little bit away from that with uh, Joel in the series. They kind of got it in. Everybody stood around, but their best is on when they're out in the run. Yep. They're running the floor. They're seeing it, and I think that Marshall plays perfectly with them. So I don't necessarily, if, if his shooting can touch can come back, that would be a bonus. Yeah, but how do you, if he can just, if he, but not to ahead. cut you off, how do you, how do you explain a broken shot? And now yeah. all of a sudden, <laughs> it's boom, metal. it's going to come it's back? All metal. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I'm not, and Rich, you probably can see, you know, in any profession, confidence is the key. That's no doubt. That's the number one ingredient. And I'm telling you, it's like a golfer. I mean, why can Tiger one week go out there and hit every friggin' fairway, and the next week he, can, he can, he's got to use a three-wood off the tee because he can't even find the fairway with the driver? It comes down to confidence, and then confidence messes with your, with your, your um, what you're doing with your backswing. And it's the same thing with a shooter. Shooters are especially, you know, shooters that are known for being able to knock down a shot. He lost his confidence. So now instead of thinking about making the basket, he's thinking about, is my elbow in? Is my form right? Is my bait and my weight? Did I follow through right? And when you do that, it's like playing baseball. Rich, you know, you play baseball. If you start thinking about your swing and start yep. thinking about where your elbow is, yep. the ball is already in the catcher's mitt and you're done. You're sitting back in the, in, the, in the dugout. So I think if they can just get him to where they're saying, listen, if you can knock some shots down, great. Get some confidence. Do some repetitive shooting. Um, but I think with him, it all comes down to confidence, and they can get a shot back if they find his confidence. And I think they're going to do that. I really do. I, I, I'm i confident in that kid. I think he is the X factor for us. Do, do you think, and this is a little more outside the box, and maybe you'll agree, maybe you you won't, that they don't want to package him with the Leonard trade because, A, they, as you said, think there's a ton of upside to have uh, an enormous amount of confidence in the kid, and I don't think you give up on a 19-year-old and call him a bust. I don't. Um, or is it, well, if we trade him, then to a man, we're actually saying that, yeah, we need Leonard, but you know what? It was a bad draft pick. That's so true. And you're not going to get the value from him right now because everybody thinks he's, you know, not, not that number one pick that he should have been. So you're going to have to package him with somebody else, whereas really your point is well taken. He's 19 years old with a ton of upside, and he was a number one draft pick for a reason. Now, that doesn't mean that the other 20 or 30 teams would have taken him number one, but let's face it, he was in the mix for a lottery pick by every single team that had lottery picks that year. So the kid is a player. He can play, and I don't think you trading him because you're not going to get the value. So I, I'm with you. I would not trade that kid right now. I think he has too much upside, and you gave up too much to get him at number one. Plus, you gave up. Think about what you did to move up to get him. Yeah. So now I think that Leonard is obviously he he's a guy that you know, if you look at what success they had, the, the guy like him is a tough matchup with anyone. Yep. So I still think there's a piece there. The Sixers can do it from a contract standpoint, from a money standpoint. It's just a matter of what the Spurs are going to get in return. And I'm not sure today what's the latest with the Spurs and what they're asking for from uh, – uh, Again, from, they're – you're probably uh, going to get them for one year, right? But yeah, but you know this, right? And I know we're a little tight with the break, but you know this. The longer it takes to move a superstar, that tells the team trying to get them, you might not have to give up as much. 
great point. Think about what they think about what OKC had to give up for uh, uh, for Paul George last year, and think about when they moved him. They yep. didn't move him to August last year, yeah, yeah. and everybody thought it was going to be a one year deal. Good point. And he was just going to go there and then go to LA. Well, guess what? Yeah, he ended up going there, being a good factor. He fit in well, and now he's there locked up long term. So, with you know, I think with Brett Brown in the mix because of his relationship with with Pop and because of the relationship with uh, Juwan, I think you have uh, you have a shot at him. So I don't think the timing is bad, and I think you're right. The longer it goes, the longer or the better it is, I think, for the Sixers. And I agree with you. And with the history with uh, Paul uh, Paul George last year, I think that helps the Sixers mentally too. So, um, but if they could get him, even if it's for a year, that would give the Sixers that. You know that that I guess that they get them over the top, and now you're looking at possibly a 60 win season, yeah. and a little deeper in the playoffs. That yeah, which the, the fan base uh, definitely deserves. All right, uh, I'm up against my 20 yep. break. Listen, great stuff. Uh, we will talk next week. Uh, I always appreciate a couple of moments, pal. Thanks, buddy. Looking forward to seeing you too. All right, you got it, Ozzy. All right, be well, Billy Osborne. Uh, join us for a couple of moments on the uh, Boardwalk Hunter Hotline.